Welcome back to the second part of the IFS lecture on fundamentals um, on uh, fundamentals of ultra high vacuum systems for atom probe tomography. So in the second part of the lecture, we're going to look into the fundamentals of vacuum systems, which means we are going to look into gas equilibrium pressures, uh, operating ranges of the various pump types. Actually, no, we're going to push that into uh, probably to, to the next part. Uh, then we look into outgassing properties, hydrogen permeability, and what other materials um, we are going to have in uh, what materials we're going to have in um, in an ultra high vacuum system. Uh, and then we look into the design principles of ultra high vacuum systems. So what kind of flanges do we have so we can put a system together from various parts? Um, and uh, what do we need to pay attention for when it comes to, uh, to pay attention to when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to designing individual parts? Uh, what I'm leaving out here for now is actually things like thermal expansion, thermal ex uh, conductivity, and so on and so forth. We'll get to that at a later point. Okay. Um, and this part is actually mostly going to be on the tablet and to a, to a lesser extent, uh, I'll show you the parts here uh, on the uh, on the demo screen. OK, and so let's get started with the uh, let's get started with the uh, with, with what kind of vacuum levels we actually have in atom probe tomography. And so let me just draw a uh, draw a simple graph of uh, so if, yeah, I should have probably done that a little bit further down. So what kind of vacuum levels, do, what kind of vacuum levels do we have? And when, uh, what sort of, uh, what sort of mean free paths and absolute pressures and so on and so forth do these, um, do this actually entail and so essentially if we go from you know low pressure to high pressure then uh, we are gonna have you know this is not this is obviously not to scale uh, we're gonna start off at ambient pressure which would be 1000 millibars and I'm writing millibars because it's it's what what you will mostly find in uh, in technical documentations so uh, one millibar, um, one millibar is one hectopascal, so a hundred pascals roughly. If you uh, so, uh, one millibar is roughly one hundred pascals. Oh, sorry, and I should switch over to the tablet, and I should not write in the top corner. Sorry, my bad. So one millibar is roughly 100 pascals. So uh, one bar is, uh, it, the, the, the factor is 1.0235, um, but it's roughly, it's roughly that, okay? Um, so we started at 1,000 millibars, then um, we'll maybe, maybe at one millibar, and then Ten to the minus three millibar. Ten to the minus six millibar. Ten to the minus nine millibars, and then we'll be at ten to the minus twelve millibars, and the end of our scale would be about ten to the minus fifteen millibars. And uh, you might think now, okay, who reaches that? People that build atomic clocks and things like that, they actually reach uh, vacuum levels uh, to that extent. And they, they actually need them. And um, so if we, look at, uh, if we look at mean free path, roughly, then uh, we're talking at this, at atmosphere, the mean free path is... Uh, uh, so if you have a gas molecule, okay, mean free path is 68 nanometers so every 68 nanometers on every uh, on average at uh, ambient pressure you will get a collision 
Um, if you go into course vacuum, uh, which would be, you know, about a millibar, um, then we're in the, I'm, I'm now just giving orders of magnitude. Okay. So, uh, this would be about 100 microns. Yeah, so every hundred micron, I, I roughly get a collision, um, in, um, in fine vacuum, which would be about 10 to the minus three ish. Um, I'd get one at about every 100 millimeters and, um, at, and then, uh, hundred, hundred millimeters, then 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus six, we'd be getting about one every roughly every hundred meters. Millimeters, hundred meters, roughly every into ten to the minus nine, roughly every one hundred kilometers, and at ten to the um, at ten to the minus twelve, it would be hundred thousand kilometers. Yeah. So ten to the five kilometers between individual collisions. So you can see that at the vacuum levels that we're working at. Right. So if we have a, um, if we have an instrument with about 10 centimeters flight path, just from the, uh, just from the molecule co uh, collisions, we would be fine pretty much at, you know, at 10 to the minus six millibars, we'd be fine. Okay. Um, but what's more important for us is actually molecules per, uh, per unit area in equilibrium roughly. And this is obviously now gas dependent. Yeah. So if you have different gases, it would be gas dependent. molecules per area um, then at uh, at atmosphere we uh, would have um, so it the, the list I'm writing it from is in square centimeters so I'll just write it in square centimeters so it would be 2.7 times 10 to the 19 molecules per square centimeters so per molecules. I'll just write it here as per square centimeter per centimeter squared. So, you know, roughly the size of a thumbnail, that would be about 2.7 times 10 to the 19. Um, in, uh, in a coarse vacuum, uh, it would be about 10 to the 16. And now if we go per square nanometer, obviously, maybe we should go per square nanometer. So, um, square centimeter to square nanometers, that would be 10 to the 16 roughly. Okay. So that would be, um, yeah, because 10 to the minus nine is meters to nanometers. So 10 to the minus 18 would be meters to, uh, square meters to square nanometers. And if we go square centimeters, it would be two orders of magnitude less. So it would be two to 16. So, uh, we would be roughly be, okay, let's go per square nanometer then per square nanometer. So we have, have about 10 per square nanometer. So that's a lot that, uh, um, um, in equilibrium, by the way, that's not per square, uh, that's not per second or something like that, that would be in equilibrium. And then at 10 to the minus three, obviously would be 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus, um, 10 to the minus nine and 10 to the minus 12. Uh, obviously this is in equilibrium. But if we go per second, molecules per second, then roughly, uh, sorry, molecules, monolayers per second. Yeah, so if we go a full monolayer, a full monolayer would be about 10 atoms per square nanometer, okay? That would be a full monolayer. Order of magnitude, they... Yes, per second. 
uh, at 10 to the minus 6, we roughly have one monolayer per second absorbing, okay? Uh, so at 10 to the minus 9, we would have one uh, 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 3 monolayers. So it takes a thousand seconds for a monolayer to absorb. Yeah? Um, and uh, here it would take a million seconds. So I don't know how many minutes that is, but a thousand, uh, a thousand seconds is uh, about 15 minutes yeah? so a thousand quarter hours so it's 250 hours roughly okay so that, that's that's uh, and that's really what interests us right so what interests us is uh what interests us is really what happens up here yeah so how many monolayers per second we absorb? Because if you think about an atom probe measurement, um, we're removing maybe a thousand or ten thousand or twenty thousand atoms per atoms, uh, atoms per second in a modern atom probe. Um, and so if you think about, you know, you having uh, ten maybe ten thousand square nanometers of area that you're removing because you know hundred nanometers by hundred nanometers would roughly be ten thousand square nanometers, um, and you have um, say so ten thousand square nanometers, and for an atomic layer you have, might have ten atoms per square nanometer, so you have, you know, some thousand, maybe 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 30, atoms per monolayer, yeah, per interval. Let's say some thousand atoms per, per monolayer um, that you want to remove per second. Then you, you can see that if you want to do that with a good signal to background ratio, you really need to be uh, at, in, a, in an area where it takes, you know, maybe a thousand times longer. So if we say we remove one monolayer per second using the atom probe, you really want to have, you know, like a thousands of a monolayer or less that absorbs in the same amount of time. And this is this is sort of why we're ending up in the um, this is sort of why we're ending up in APT territory. Uh, for field arm microscopy, it's a little bit different because, of course, the, the absolute pressure is not as good as a measurement because you need to put some gas into your system to facilitate the imaging, which means the pressure during the measurement is maybe 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5 millibars, maybe 10 to the minus 7, depending on how cold your specimen is. Um, whereas an atom probe, we really want to be below 10 to the minus 9 millibars. Okay, so this is, uh, this is where we want to be. Um, and... Um, this means we need to make sure that we have um, that we have surfaces that um, that don't ruin our vacuum because in the end most of the contamination uh, are, so once we've removed essentially uh, all of the once you've removed all of the, the the gas that was in there as an atmosphere. What remains is whatever was whatever dirt or whatever you had absorbed on the various um, on the various surfaces in your uh, uh, in your system. And so, if we look at uh, if we look at uh, what problem we then have, then it is the problem of gas equilibrium pressures. Um, at low temperature, because this is essentially um, this is essentially what li what limits us in terms of atom probe measurement, because you can imagine that um, what I've drawn before is the um, is the, the condition that any uh, con any background contaminant that we will get or any DC evaporated gas atoms that we will get on our atom probe measurement are actually caused by gas atoms directly absorbing onto the tip. And this is not actually the case. Uh, and the reason uh, why uh, this is not the case is that if you have an atom probe sample and you have, you know, this is, this is the, the magnitude of the field, then 
what you have is a field gradient. Okay, so this is our this is our electric field, and what will happen is that any polarizable atom will just hop towards the field gradient. Yeah? So this is the gradient of the field points us towards the tip. So the area that we get adsorption that is actually relevant to our contamination is much larger than uh, than just if I would just draw a circle here and say, okay, this is this is the area we, we care about. And so what we care about is actually which atoms can, uh, which molecules uh, can we have in our system that can hop bit by bit to the uh, to the end of the tip. Obviously, since our tip is cold, so let's say it's, you know, 40 Kelvin, no, 40 Kelvin, then if you have something like a large molecule, it will not be able to hop to the end here, but it will still, you know, cause contamination. Um, and so if we draw, uh, if we draw the vapor pressure, so essentially the saturation, vapor pressure versus the temperature for various gases. And um, I'll essentially do it. Well, it's it's kind of log, but you know, I'm drawing freehand, so don't don't give me a hard time on that. Um, then you'll see that if we're, um, I'll just give you orders of magnitude here. So this will be roughly, um, this will be in Pascals. Okay. So uh, let's do it in millibar. Let's do it in millibar, just so that I don't. Uh, usually, if you find physicists, uh, physical literature on stuff, it's if you find physical li literature on stuff, it's um, it's very often in Pascals. If you find engineering literature, it's in millibar. So, uh, and let's keep the Pascals then. Okay. So uh, if we draw ten to the four. This would be 10 to the 2, 10, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6, and 10 to the minus 8. So this would be um, this would be uh, this would be roughly 10 to the minus 10 millibar. Okay, just just to keep the connection. Um, and uh, if we say here, okay, so this is for Kelvin, which is, you know, liquid uh, helium at ambient pressure, um, evap uh, evaporation, and then we'll do 10 Kelvin here, 20 Kelvin here, and maybe 80 Kelvin here. Sorry again about the scale, but it's kind of logarithmic-ish. Uh, I'm just drawing it freehand off of uh, uh, off of other things, and then we'll get to you know, uh, let's say this would be 200 Kelvin, something like that. Um, then you will see that um, essentially helium is pretty hard to condense, right? So at about um, at about four Kelvin, you know, this would be this would be roughly the curve for helium. So helium will pretty much always move around, um, and it's but it's it's just a single molecule, so it's not as easy to polarize as some as other molecules. Um, but if we look at uh, if we look at hydrogen, we'll get a curve that looks roughly um, that looks roughly like this, right? So this would be hydrogen, uh, neon just a little bit, uh, just a little bit above it. So if you if you actually want something like that to scale, you can pretty easily Google it. Neon, um, but the things that are more important for us is actually things like CO, nitrogen, uh, so carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and the like, and um, and obviously water vapor. So this would roughly be the curve for, so let's, let's just keep it an area here. Okay. So this would roughly be the area, uh, where we would have argon, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, um, 
oxygen, methane. Um, yeah, this, this would be the most important ones that sort of bottom out at 20 Kelvin. Um, and at about 60 ish Kelvin, we'd have CO2 bottling, CO2 bottling in out. And um, so this would be, this here would be roughly 60 Kelvin. Um, and for um, for, hydro, uh, for for water vapor, it would essentially be about 120 Kelvin. The literature on water vapor is pretty vast, so uh, uh, there's a, yeah there's, there's some measurement, measurement discrepancies. Um, anyway, so what this what this graph essentially tells us is that you know at roughly the intersection here, yeah, this is this is the pressure that uh, so this is the temperature at which these uh, these gases would freeze somewhere and they would they would stop moving, yeah, essentially. And you can see that for water vapor, um, this actually happens at a relatively at uh, with no additional force. What we have to account for, obviously, is that in atom probe tomography we have polariz the polarization force that I just talked about, and um, this means we'll get a little sorry I about that. But essentially, this gives us the temperatures, and if we uh, if we go to a little bit higher pressures, we can see roughly what sort of temperatures we can afford with uh, with the various gases. Um, for us, most important are, uh, uh, first most important are anything that we can have ingress from. So we can have hydrogen, we can have argon, nitrogen and oxygen and water vapor. These are for us the most important things because they are components of air. Uh, hydrogen, not as much. Uh, we'll get to the hydrogen separately. Let me just erase that and we'll just make the hydrogen in a different color. Okay, so the red ones are, let me just write that here. Red ones are the components of air. And hydrogen is contamination from various sources. We'll get into a second. The most important source, or one of the most important sources for a hydrogen for us, is actually um, is actually the chamber itself. But it can also be other things, like if you have moisture in your system then um, then uh, the moisture might go somewhere where it gets ionized like an iron getter pump or a hot filament or something like that and dissociate into hydrogen and uh, and oxygen so there are various reactions that can happen in this case yeah but these are the these are the important ones for us so you can see that the typical measurement temperatures of a apt and let me just Put that here so yeah typical apt temperature we do have to we do have to worry about things like argon nitrogen and oxygen so if we have some air ingress through some means we actually do have to worry about those okay and uh water water vapor itself would actually be mostly frozen out um, but of course, if the water vapor is already where uh, where we're doing our measurements, so essentially, if you haven't left your your sample in the load lock or in the buffer chamber for long enough, then um, obviously would still have uh, would still have uh, water vapor somewhere where we um, where we do our measurement. Okay. Uh, and so the question, of course, then is. Uh, how do I make sure that I have as little of those contaminations in as possible? And um, so here, this is just uh, this is just one way of drawing. Okay, we have a you know we have a surface. We have a surface. Yeah, and we have a molecule coming off. 
and we have molecules coming in. Okay, this is, this is equilibrium. Yeah. Oh, they should. But of course, for us, the question is then um, if I, okay, at my temperature or what, whatever uh, pressure I'm working at, um, in equilibrium, it might be fine. But how long does it take to get to that equilibrium? And uh, this is actually something that's very, very important for us in, uh, in atom probe tomography. And for that, we actually need to look at the kinetics of, a, of, the, of, a, of the desorption process, okay? So uh, what we're gonna be looking at now is actually the time to reach a certain pressure. Time to reach a certain pressure. And uh, so if I, again, you know, draw some graph for that, we can have, uh, we can have the time T here in seconds. And we'll have the, let's make it a little bit longer. We'll have the adsorption energy in kilojoules per mole here. And this is actually the time, um, the, the time for desorption of a monolayer. Okay. Uh, and if we look at that, then, um, it will uh, depend on uh, on the temperature, obviously, and it will depend on the kind of pressure we want to we want to uh, um, we want to reach. Okay, and so this the first uh, the first thing here is this is for room temperature. Okay, and if we are at room temperature, then Okay, we might be at 80, 120, 160, 200. Um, and uh, if we're at room temperature and we want to reach um, 7 to 11, so this would be about 10 to the 7 seconds. 10 to the 11 seconds, 7, 11, um, that's 10 to the 15, 10 to the 15 seconds. Okay. And 10 to the seven, you know, this is, this is, this is roughly, this is about one year. And, uh, so if we want to reach 10 to the minus eight Pascals, uh, which would be about 10 to the minus 10 millibars, then the graph would look something like this. Okay. So this would be, I could probably do that in color. I think that would be nice. Okay, let's do that in in color. Okay, so this would be 10 to the minus eight Pascals. Then we'll take green. Oh, that obviously shouldn't go. Doesn't make a bend here. Anyway, this is only rough. This is only rough drawing by me. I hope that's clear to everyone. This would be 10 to the minus 13 pascals. 
and the very long one. This would be roughly 10 to the minus 18 pascals. So um, essentially what that means is if we go, um, if, if we change the adsorption energy, uh, so if we have a surface, uh, and uh, we need a delta E, uh, so let's call it delta E, we need a delta E to desorb our molecule, then um, if we um, if we have a um, if we have a, uh, a relatively short a, a relatively small adsorption energy, um, then the adsorption energy can be overcome relatively easily by uh, by by just the thermal energy at room temperature. Um, which means if we're below about eighty kilojoules per mole, you know we get relatively rapid adsorption. Then we'll get to some point here, which is uh, T max yeah, and E max. And uh, this means that if, you know, if our, um, if our molecules have an adsorption energy of E max, then they will stay in the system for the longest. And at room temperature, yeah, at room temperature at 10 to the minus 8 megapascals, that would roughly be um, an adsorption energy of about uh, of about a hundred kilojoules per mole. A uh, hundred kilojoules per mole. If the uh, desorption energy becomes significantly higher than that, becomes higher than that, or significantly higher than that, the uh, atoms just would not desorb. Okay, because essentially it's a Boltzmann distribution, right? Uh, so if you had a high, um, if you had a relatively high um, adsorption uh, energy, then the then the, the the molecules just simply wouldn't uh, wouldn't dissolve. This, uh, since I said okay, this is at room temperature, obviously changes quite a lot if we go to um, to elevated temperatures. So if I do the same graph with eighty. 120, 160, 200, it's 80, 120, 160, 200, delta E kilojoule per mole. And here now I'll use a little bit of a different scale because here this would be 10 to the second, oh sorry, 10 to the minus 2, uh, 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 4. Yeah, so we had a quite a different scale than, uh, um, than, uh, than here at room temperature if we go at bakeout temperature. Yeah. Bakeout temperature, and that would be 573 Kelvin. So this is ex it doesn't mean that the bakeout temperature is going to be exactly to 573 Kelvin or 300 uh, degrees Celsius, it's just an example, okay? Uh, and if you um, if you look at that, then you will see that uh, the maximum that we have for, uh, you know, for the lowest one, should I use, I should probably use different colors then, um, would also roughly be at those values, right? So this would, these, these are gonna be our, um, these are gonna be our most problematic ones. So this would be 10 to the minus, Eight pascals again, then maybe yellow. I hope you can gonna be able to see that properly. Um, then we're gonna have a bit of a shift. Up to here for 10 to the minus 13 pascals and this would um, this should this should be fairly straight 
and this would be roughly 10 to the minus 18 pascals. So you can see that, you know, for what interests us mostly is around here and here. Uh, it now means that we desorb a monolayer in about, you know, in a fraction of a second. Yeah. Um, and uh, that is actually what we need to do because otherwise here you can see to desorb a monolayer uh, for the worst, worst kind of molecules would take about, um, would take about a year. Uh, and um, actually this sounds pretty crazy, but this is one of the reasons why we don't like to open uh, ultra vacuum systems because, you know, you can get rid of those uh, molecules if you wait for long enough. And some people actually do that. I know some people that run atom probes, just open the atom probe and then just wait for, a, uh, wait for a couple of weeks until the vacuum is where they want it to be. Yeah? So you don't need to bake. But you can see that uh, you get a desorption in both cases. Yeah? But um, the, the thing is that here, the desorption goes into a second, a fraction of a second. And here the desorption goes in, uh, in a time scale of roughly a year. So the question is then, of course, you know, typical, what are these typical, typical desorption energies? And um, unfortunately, um, you can't really find very solid numbers on desorption energies for most of what interests us. But I, I want to give you some, uh, I want to give you some rough uh, estimates of what it could be, for example, for uh, values that I found and desorption energies, so delta, um, let me just draw it here. Let me just make a little table here and just give you some examples. Yeah. So uh, of delta E's, for example, for hydrogen on ruthenium, specifically the ruthenium basal plane 0001, uh, oh, 001. Um, it would roughly be um, two to five kilojoules per mole. So, be kilojoules per mole. Um, then uh, CO2 on copper. CO2 on copper would roughly be 10 to 30. Um, if you go to the heavier noble gases, xenon, on nickel would be uh, would be about um, 15 to 25 uh, kilojoules per mole. Um, if you go to um, some metals, so for example, if you go hydrogen from uh, nickel, we would be sort of in the range of 30 to a hundred. So that would obviously be a little bit problematic. Um, carbon monoxide from nickel, uh, sorry, carbon monoxide from nickel. A lot of people do studies on nickel if they do surface science. Um, carbon monoxide would be a hundred to 150. Um, and oxygen from, um, oxygen from ruthenium and palladium and the like. So oxygen from ruthenium, palladium uh, would be 200 to 250, right? So this is a sort of orders of magnitude where we are in this. So there are quite a lot of adsorbates that would actually be in, in, in pressure ranges where it really interests us, okay? Um, yeah, but this is this is my this is the main reason why we're why we're actually doing bakeouts, right? So what we want to do is we want to go to to temperatures where uh, we can we can dissolve um, our where we can dissolve our um, 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 where we can dissolve our um, adsorbates very easily. In practice, um, if I plot time versus um, If I plot time versus pressure while I'm baking while I'm baking my system, uh, so if I plot, oh, do I have a color? Or oh. log pressure, 
Yeah, and we'll start at uh, or pressure, but in a logarithmic plot. Sorry. So if we put uh, ten to the ten to the three, so one bar, log b in millibar. Uh, ten. 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 12 over time. Um, then it would usually look something like this. So it would go, you know, you would go down, down to about that pressure level here, about, let's say, 10 to the minus seven millibars roughly and do that at room temperature. Then you'll go to your baking temperature and you'll increase the pressure. It will first go up. Uh, it will first go up and then it will go down and you'll be able to get it to maybe, you know, 10 to the minus, probably not 10 to the minus nine. somewhere around here now yeah. so this would be then at baking temperature let's say around 150 degrees C the limiting factor if you do atom probe tomography it's usually the micro channel plates can't take more than 150 degrees C that's why we always will be pretty much baking at pretty much the same temperature um, and then it will go down again and it will go to some ultimate pressure that might be, you know, um, that might be somewhere around here. Huh? That may be somewhere around 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus five times 10 to the minus 11 or some, some, somewhere around there, right? And then over a long, long period of time, we'll just start approaching that. And uh, so up here, up here, we, this is essentially desorption limited. So this is desorption limited, desorption of contaminants limited. And this is limited by the vacuum materials. Okay. We're not going to go very deep into what limits the whole thing uh, down here, but essentially it's some outgassing, for example, uh, of, uh, of hydrogen from, sta from the stainless steel. Um, or um, water vapor coming out of polymers and so on and so forth. Okay, we'll we'll get to that in a bit. Um, and typically, you know, this is, uh, you know, if we go times, then this would maybe one minute to one hour. Then the bakeout period here, you know, until you done with this. You know, that depends on when you actually reach what kind of pressure. You can obviously wait for longer, yeah? but this would be something like 24 hours to uh, however long you want. You know, I've done bakes for weeks. Um, and um, yeah, and then this would, yeah, this goes relatively quickly until your, your system is cooled down. So this might take, you know, until, until you're reaching something like here, this might take then another 12 hours or something. And then, you know, over the years, the vacuum will hopefully get better uh, unless you could keep putting dirty samples in, then the vacuum will get worse. Yeah. Um, but this is roughly what would happen during, uh, uh during a bakeout. Um, and, um, this period, the length of the bakeout essentially depends on how clean, on how hot you go with your bakeout. So the hotter you bake, the quicker it goes. Um, 
on the thermal connectivity of your system. So if you've got a system with a lot of things that are thermally well isolated from the rest of the system because they are, for example, you have cooled parts in there, uh, then it takes longer because you obviously need to equilibrate the heat. And in atom probe tomography, uh, for us, we have a thermally insulated stage. So usually, you know, it's a good idea to bake for uh, 36 hours. We are, for example, have ultra vacuum coating systems where everything is thermally well connected there you only need to bake for 24 hours or maybe even 12 hours and the whole system will get evenly warm yeah and what contaminants you have but this is roughly this is roughly the the baking schedule that you would uh, that, that you would have um and uh yeah and this actually gets you to ultra high vacuum now this gets you to ultra high vacuum um, and uh, the question then is, okay, so this was all now, uh, looking at, uh, this was all now looking at, you know, how do I, uh, or how do I get the gases out without any look at, looking at all at the, um, without looking at all at the materials themselves and, uh, the materials themselves. So I just want to mention about the vacuum materials themselves. Um, they um, can then also provide uh, provide some uh, some residual uh, some residual contaminants. So this is so the, the part up here is what we've looked at so far. The question is now, okay, what happens here down at the vacuum materials part? And so what we have here is uh, essentially we have um, okay. Let's. Uh, Make that green. So from the green part here, what do we have? Or what are the most important things for us? So one thing that we have is we'll get hydrogen from the stainless steel. Then we get water vapor from any polymers we use. Um, and um, we get uh, we get short chains, for example, CH4 and the like from organic residues. And the most important organic residue is, of course, if you touch something, uh, if you touch something with your fingers, you will have organic residues. Um, and uh, also from the MCPs, so the MCPs do outgas some CH4 as well, or some, uh, they, well, they outgas some um, hydrocarbons. Usually longer chain ones are not as much, um, um, not as much of a problem because they have higher desorption energies. Yeah? But CH4 from, uh, from organic residues, from the MCPs, uh, this is also something, uh, something we get from here. Um, and then we have, uh, we have argon. Oh no, sorry. This is also something we already, we already discussed before. Argon from air ingress, uh, oh sorry. Um, yeah, let's put it here as well so we can have argon, nitrogen, oxygen from virtual leaks. So again, this, this list is not fully exhaustive because depending, if you, for example, have aluminium parts, then you have an aluminium hydroxide where you can get things coming out of the hydroxide. Um, if you have coatings, uh, if you, if you put in materials in the ultra vacuum system that you evaporate, so you might want to build a uh, specimen coder in your atom probe where you can coat your specimen right with the, um, right inside the chamber, then you might get some outgassing from the materials there, but this is not something what that we, uh, that we cover. What we cover is mostly hydrogen from the stainless steel, water from the polymers, uh, CH4 from organic residues. We're not going to go deeply into that because the solution is pretty obvious. Keep stuff clean. We'll just go into the cleaning later. Um, and uh, anything from virtual leaks and we'll go into the design, uh, in the design uh, of the materials and was into what virtual leaks are and how we can, uh, how we can deal with them. Uh, 
Okay, so the question is now... Um, For our vacuum materials, what do we mean by hydrogen ingress from uh, hydrogen ingress from the materials? So, um, this is the first thing we're going to look at is actually hydrogen from the stainless steel. Yeah. And so, what we get in this, oh, what we get in this case is actually that, so. Sorry, I'll need my notes for a second so that I draw stuff to scale as I should. Oh, where did I put that? So essentially what we need to look at when we um, I drop that. Is how much uh, hydrogen we have coming out of the um, that we have coming out of the stainless steel, and um, this essentially tells us how much pumping work we need how much pumping work we need to do in order um, so how much um, how much this so, uh, how much do we need to do um, or what is the equilibrium of um of um hydrogen inlaying stainless steel so if you've done atom pro before so if you're not 100 percent new to atom pro but if you've new, if you've done atom pro before uh you might have noticed that um there is a fake you know let's call it fake because it doesn't come from the sample a hydrogen peak which is typically about 50 to 300 ppm. This is obviously not, you know, something solid, but something that I've found from looking uh, at a couple of Adam probe data sets. Um, and if you look at hydrogen in hydrogen content in standard in, or let's call it in, you know, some, uh, X six crony eighteen up eighteen ten. This would roughly be about uh, one weight ppm, uh, which is around fifty six um, atomic ppm. Okay. Um, and, um, the thing about that is if you look at, you know, if you look at equilibrium pressure versus temperature, what you see is you will get a typical, you know, you get the typical, uh, desorption curve, um, where, you know, this is log T and this is log P and here would be, um, and here we would be at um, at about you know ten thousand millibar or ten to the ten bar essentially or ten thousand millibar. Yeah. And here would be roughly thousand. Here would be one bar. And uh, hundred millibar, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if you look at that, um, and here we've got fifty, hundred, two hundred, five hundred thousand. So twenty, fifty, one hundred, two hundred, five hundred, and this would be about a thousand. 
um, in degree C. Then you'll see here, the, here we'll get hydrogen uptake. And uh, here we'll get hydrogen depletion. Yeah. At a certain level of kinetics, of course, because um, if you had very low temperatures, the diffusion speed of even of hydrogen in solids is going to be um, it's going to be relatively slow. And if you look at that, this is this is mostly where we are working, right? So um, we uh, usually work in a in an area where we get hydrogen depletion. So this would be for one weight. PPM uh, and so hydrogen can come out of the uh, can come out of the system and the way that usually works is that you have you know you have hydrogen here hydrogen here and this would be this would be the bulk of our material yeah? so stainless steel and what would happen is they would come to the surface yeah? It would come to the surface, combine to H2, and then leave. Yeah. So this is just uh, this equilibrium for going to the surface, and then we've got an additional step of desorption. I'm not going to go into the details of the energetics of what's happening here, but essentially, of course, in this case, we can be diffusion limited or we can be desorption limited. Yeah. So we have... diffusion and then we have desorption yeah. and um, this combination actually causes uh, causes us to have hydrogen in our um, in our measurement um, and a typical outgassing rate for stainless steel, obviously you can see that, you know, if I change something about the surface or something about the diffusion, then obviously I can strongly influence or just how much hydrogen there is in the steel. I can strongly influence of how much I get desorbing. But um, essentially, uh, usually an outgassing rate is, this is usually happening at around uh, 10 to the minus 11 millibar liter per square centimeter and second yeah? um, and so uh, if we then look at um, uh, look at how much we'll have in a typical chamber so in a typical chamber I calculated for two millimeter wall thickness so um, so for two millimeter wall thickness, chamber with two millimeter wall thickness um, that would be roughly around 0 0.1 millibar liter per cubic centimeter now and if you calculate that then um, for a typical atom probe chamber, so I've done it for my for one of the chambers I've uh, typical um, chamber with six thousand square centimeters, roughly. Um, you'll get roughly six six thousand liters a second. roughly 6,000 liters per second uh, coming off at the uh, at the pressure of 10 to the minus 11 millibars uh, uh, and that's roughly our operating pressure now if you obviously if you say okay I'm at 10 at 10 to the minus 10 millibars then obviously it would be 600 liters per second and uh, if you know where we uh, where I'm going with that, maybe then you might remember that. Um, let's go to one of the earlier slides. Um, where is our leap system design? Uh, our leap system vacuum system drawing. Oh yeah, 
that we have an iron getter pump of about 300 to 500 liters per second. Again, you can look up which model is on your, on your instrument. Um, and um, if you look at that graph here, you can already see then why roughly we will be ending up at um, five times 10 to the minus 11 or something, because um, this is at 10 to the minus 11 millibars. Uh, or around 600 liters per second at 10 to the minus 10 millibars. And so this is, these are all just orders of magnitude, right? right? Uh, but this sort of should give you an idea of why we roughly end up at, uh, at certain pressures. Um, because, you know, this about 10 to the minus 11 millibar liters per square centimeter second, this is of, often a pressure sort of an outgassing rate you will find for vacuum materials. And very often it's not quite specific of what kind of contaminants come off. Usually we assume it's mostly hydrogen, but it can also be other residual contaminants coming off like uh, CO, CO2, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But this is roughly why we're ending up at these pressures that we, um, that we end up at. at. So the question is then, uh, what kind of vacuum materials do we have or can we use? And um, this is relatively uh, simple, uh, uh, in a hand wavy way, it's relatively simple because uh, what materials do we have available? So essentially what we need is uh, structural, uh, so we need materials with various properties. And so, So what kind of vacuum materials do we have? So we have metals. And metals we need for strength. Yeah? We need them for uh, thermal conductivity. And we need them for electrical conductivity. And they are usually uh, for strength and not so much for thermal and electrical conductivity. Um, for strength, we use stainless steel. Yeah. And this is, this is mostly due to the fact that it's just easy to make stuff out of stainless steel, okay? But we can also use, uh, we can also use titanium we can use aluminium and we use various copper alloys. And mu metal is also pretty, pretty popular. And they all have different properties for different experiments. For APT, um, I guess for us, the only things that are ever going to be important are going to be stainless steel, titanium and aluminium. Yeah. I'm not going to go through the outgassing properties of the different uh, materials, but essentially stainless steel has a downside of hydrogen outgassing. Um, aluminium has the downside of non-specific outgassing, not hydrogen outgassing. So it might be better for, for, for atom prop tomography than stainless steel. But the problem is, and you'll see that later with flange, it's easy to damage as well. Uh, titanium has uh, no hydrogen outgassing and also uh, relatively low levels of other contaminants. So this is uh, pretty much the delix uh, material for making an atom probe. Then we have things uh, where we have thermal or electric conductivity, and that's essentially the same things we're using here. And here we use uh, copper alloys. Uh, various copper alloys, uh, we use aluminium alloys, um, and which ones uh, we'll get to in, in detail um, at, at a later point in the lecture when we go to temperature measurements, conductivities, and so on. Uh, then we have uh, ceramics. And ceramics we use for um, thermal conductivity.
and electrical insulation. And electrical insulation. Um, and essentially, um, if we want to have thermal conductivity and electrical insulation, both we use um, sapphire. And if we, so sapphire is good for thermal conductivity and obvious electrical insulation. Um, so I'll make two arrows. Uh, and if we go for, elect uh, for electrical insulation only, uh, we can use um, um, we can use sort of compound uh, machinable ceramics, um, and this would be things like Ma Marco. Um, and if we want to have machinability um, and electrical uh, and um, and thermal conductivity. There's something called, uh, so we, here we can use sapphire or aluminium nitride. And there's something called, um, something called chapal, which is essentially aluminium nitride with boron oxide. I don't know the top of my head right now. That's machinable. Okay. So these two are machinable. These two here are machinable whereas these two here you need to do by laser cutting but you can even get diamond these days laser cut into into shapes that uh, that you need for uh, uh, for anything here uh, we can uh, combine those two things here as well by a fretting Um, and we have, uh, I'm going to leave glass out because, uh, we're not going to go into detail of the different glasses. And then we have polymers, polymers and polymers we use for thermal insulation. And or electrical insulation. Uh, and for polymers at the pressure range that we are working at, essentially we are going to be using um, polyether ether ketone, PEK, um, or we are going to use polyimide. Very often uh, you might know it under the uh, trade name Vespel, okay, so polyimide. And to a lesser extent, but in APD, we're not going to use, use it. We can use PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene. Um, the problem with, uh, or the trade name you probably know as Teflon, the problem with uh, PTFE is it degrades under iron irradiation. That's why usually in atom prop or any iron related work, uh, you leave out PTFE. That's why uh, we're using mostly PEK and PA. Um, in terms of vacuum, ceramics are generally unproblematic. We can have, can contain moisture. Polymers will contain moisture. So in terms of ultimum, uh, uh, um, um, in terms of ultimum vacuum performance, um, polymers are actually not that bad. The problem with them is they will take up around one weight percent water vapor at room temperature. So the high, uh, at room temperatures are the hydro hygroscopic. So at ambient pressure, if you leave it out and you know, initially before you put it in, you will have left it out. It will pick up about 1% of water vapor that can move relatively quickly between the polymer chains and will then outgas during your uh, bake out and during your sub subsequent operation. And this is one of the main re reasons why we want to have atom probe systems uh, pumped down for as long as possible, because we need thermal insulation and, ele and electrical insulation by polymers. Um, and as a result, 
if you open the system and you close it up again, it will take up moisture and the moisture will slowly come out from the uh, from between the polymer chains uh, again. So PEK can go up to 150 degrees C um, and polyimid can go up to about 220 degrees C. Um, polyimid can take a little bit more moisture, uh, will take up a little bit more moisture than PEK as well, according to the specifications. But that so far has not really been that much of a uh, of a concern, at least not uh, as far as I found. Um, the difference is then this is an expensive polymer. This is a really expensive polymer. Let me just show you the different polymers. I've got them. Um, I've got them over at the uh, demo booth, so you can see here. This is this is typically. Uh, Poly, uh, this is typical PEK. It's this brownish uh, color. Yeah, it's this brownish color, uh, and you can buy it. A piece like this would only cost a couple of euros, maybe you know five euros, something like that. Uh, you can buy entire like rods, longer rods, for maybe two hundred euros, uh, and you can use them pretty easily in um, in your ultra vacuum system. And this is typical polyimide. So this is Vespel. Yeah. Uh, so you can see it's got a distinct dark brown color in its natural state. Um, and um, this rod in this size would cost about $100, $100 roughly. So it's really, really expensive, right? So I have, I have a piece like this. It's a little bit longer, uh, maybe, you know, like this long. Uh, that costed me about a thousand euros. Yeah. So Vespel is really, 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 really expensive. But it also has a high strength. It has a strength comparable to aluminium. Um, and it's easy to machine. And you can bake it to, to fairly high temperatures. Um, as I've mentioned before, with polymers, the, the important thing to remember is the more polymer volume you have in there, the more moisture you have inserted. That's why very often, if so, this is, a, uh, this is actually a piece where I made a, where I made a mistake. Uh, but this is what would, for example, be a spacer for a um, for a buffer chamber carousel, and you can see that we've uh, put a lot of uh, machining in so that um, so that we reduce the volume um, of PEK or the volume of polymer as much as we can, um, and thus also reduce the amount of contamination you get into the system uh, as much as we can. Good. So, uh, so far for the materials, um, obviously the material science behind ultra high vacuum materials is, uh, quite a wide field with, uh, very, very little actual data. So there's quite a lot of speculations and experience that people have and, um, you know, uh, essentially stories people tell you. But there's uh, not as much uh, solid science as I would like. Uh, but you can find some papers on outgassing rates, on um, uh, on materials properties, and so on and so forth. But you know the materials I've showed you so far um, are actually the um, are actually the most common ones. Maybe one thing I could put down. Where did I put my pen now? So one thing I could put down is the copper alloys that we use for strength mostly are. Um, copper uh, to beryllium so it's beryllco or whatever you want to call it uh, and copper chromium zirconium yeah. um, and this uh, the copper beryllium has a very high strength of about, about a thousand megapascals uh, the copper chromium zirconium has a strength like a normal steel uh, but with beryllium copper, obviously, you need to take care that, you know, you don't uh, breathe in any dust you produce while you're making the parts. Yeah, but these are essentially the the, uh, um, the alloys we're using. And um, as you can see, we need to somehow combine those parts. Um, you, if you've ever seen an ultra vacuum system, uh, it might already be very clear to you that, you know, it's not just, you know, one thing you weld it together and then just that thing just existed. Uh, but rather what you're going to have is you're going to have a, a system that you, you're going to have a system that you put together that consists of multiple parts. So the next question that we need to ask ourselves is 
how do we put those parts together? Yeah? And we put those parts together uh, by using different flanges. Yeah? And uh, the one thing, the one that I want to draw to, the, the one that I want to draw for you is UHV. Let's just call that slide UHV flanges. Um, and so I've mentioned before that um, we need to be able to bake our system. So in order to be able to bake our system, uh, we need to, we can only use materials that can withstand the baking temperature. UHV flanges are there for all metal flanges, okay? And they're so-called CF flanges are the most common ones. And so essentially, if we want to have, uh, if we want to combine different um, ultra high vacuum, if we want to combine different ultra high vacuum parts into a system, uh, what we need is to uh, some way of uh, sealing up the system. And if we have a CF flange, that is actually done by having knife edges. Yeah? So that you have, essentially, this is your flange. Yeah? This is your flange. So this is your flange and you know, it might go back here and then back up here. A and what do we have in between here is a gasket. So we'll have a, and I'll just use something copper colored so that you can get an idea that this is our, this is our gasket and this is flange one and flange two. Um, and then here, we'll have a bolt going through so that we can, uh, we can actually combine the two flanges. Yeah. Um, these flanges are good from about uh, from 16 to uh, 250 oh, from 60 to 250 millimeters and uh, I think it will make it a sense in a second when I'll show you the parts why it sort of has a an upper limit range um, and if we want to go any larger than that we'll use wire flanges. So you have a flange with again a bolt going through and you'll have a You'll have a wire gasket, gasket where you where you push an edge into the wire. And this is the principle of a COF flange. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that simply is that you, if you punch the gaskets out of a sheet of uh, copper, then if you make them very large, you will just lose a, a lot of copper. And it becomes impractical because they also bend pretty easily. And so the COF flanges we use uh, for usually for larger than 250 millimeters. Uh, you can get CF flanges that are larger than 250 millimeters, but that's sort of the somewhere between Somewhere between 200 millimeters and half a meter, this is sort of the, the cutoff between, uh, between the different sizes. Because there are ultra high vacuum systems, especially in the electronics industry, uh, where you might have some very large, very large flanges. Okay, so let me just show you what those flanges look like in real life. So if you have a, uh, if you have a CF flange, I just told you that, um, 
if you have a CF flange, I just told you that you have some kind of um, copper gasket and some kind of knife edge. Oh, I can't get into my gloves. Yeah. So in order to not contaminate uh, the samples, I will actually, uh, or not contaminate the parts, I will properly use gloves. What you can see here, this is a typical, this is a typical CF flange, right? So this is a, a flange size called CF40, which means a clear bore that goes through here uh, would be at least uh, would be at least 40 millimeters. Yeah? And what you can see at the side here is actually the knife edge. Let me just point you a little bit. Let me just point you there a bit more. So this here, this is the knife edge. And the knife edge, as it sounds, is supposed to be as sharp as possible. This means that if we deal with those flanges, we need to take a lot of care to not damage the knife edge. So if you make an, if you create a nick in there, then uh, the sealing action would not properly work anymore. It really needs to be very, very sharp. And you actually have to throw away the flange. There's, I don't think there's really a practical way to repair them. So always take care that you don't damage the knife edge. And that's why we have cups like these ones, where we can put you know, plastic cups like these ones, uh, where we can put our flanges in and then maybe put a lid on, dog on top uh, just to make sure that oh, it's actually done the other way around in this case, I think. So that we don't damage the, uh, so we don't damage the knife edge. Well, oh, maybe it was this way around. Anyway, don't damage the knife edge. Uh, and in between, uh, we actually uh, we actually put um, seals like this. So this here would be a CF two hundred seal, and this uh, would also be a CF two hundred seal. Uh, the difference between the two seals is that uh, the silverish seal is silver plated, and the copper colored uh, seal is just copper. And essentially, you get three different types of those seals, um, or three different. Um, Four different types if you count all combinations and is you can get seals that are uh, s rolled copper so the copper is relatively strong and this would be one of those yeah so this is relatively strong copper uh, because it's uh, it's essentially cold rolled copper and uh, just a ring punched out and you can see here this is a used one so you can see where the knife edge had been pushed in um, and if you take the seal out it should have a very nice imprint of the knife edge all around it then here, what we have here is a um, is a silver plated version, and you can see I can very easily even just with my fingers bend the whole uh, the whole seal. And the reason is that this uh, seal has been both copper, uh, both silver uh, plated, and is also annealed, so it's much much softer. No? And this here is the same thing, just in a different size. So this is for uh, sixty three millimeter inner diameter. No? And this is for uh, 200 millimeter inner diameter. And the different, uh, the reasons for the different, uh, for the different uh, kind of seals is that uh, if you bake to very high temperatures, and you have, then uh, the silver uh, helps the the um, helps the gasket to not stick to your ultra high vacuum parts. Okay. If you have uh, only copper and you bake to very high temperatures, you might get the copper sticking to the stainless steel a little bit. Huh? It's not very, unless you pick a too very high temperature, that's not actually much of a concern. Uh, the other factor is having the gaskets annealed or not annealed. Um, the difference is mainly that if you have the gas, if you, um, if you have anything where you put a load on, right? So for example, we very often have our load locks bolted on and just freestanding. Then you would want to use something with a little bit of strength. So uh, just a rolled one yeah, that hasn't been annealed. Uh, if you have parts where you cannot have any residual stresses in the part, for example, if you have a viewport, then you want to use a annealed soft gasket so that you don't put stress on the viewport, which might crack the viewport. Okay. Um, and then when you put the uh, uh, when you put the gaskets together, sorry, I don't have a CF. I, I do have a CF forty here. Actually, so what I've shown you is just CF flanges with um, uh, metal gaskets, but you can, you can actually get rubber gaskets for CF flanges as well. 
This is just if you have a CF part somewhere and you don't need super high vacuum and you don't always want to throw away all the copper gaskets, uh, then you can use some neoprene gas, uh, some uh, Viton gaskets as well if you get to buy. Of course, then you lose the advantage of bakeability. Um, so you can't, uh, you can't bake anymore then. Uh, and here we have a typical um, CF flange part. And if you want to put those together, so I don't have a CF40 gasket here right now, what you need to do is you need to put, you know, you need to look at where the leak detection, um, uh, where the leak detection grooves are. Sorry, I haven't explained those before. So those CF flanges, they have grooves on them and the grooves, they're supposed to be vertical. Yeah? And the reason why they exist is uh, because uh, you use them for leak testing. So if you leak test your system, uh, you can blow helium in from the bottom. It will escape from the top. And then you have a pump pumping out, uh, pumping out the system and detecting if any helium got into the system. Or you can do it in reverse and put helium into your system and see if it comes out. And so you need to align them. You need to put the gasket in between, and then you put the bolts in, and then you tighten. Then you tighten the bolts just like you would tighten the bolts in your in your car's uh, in your car's wheels. So you always tighten them across. So first this one, and 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 this one, um, in various stages. So I usually, you know, tighten them by hand until until everything sits flush on the copper gasket. So usually the easiest way to do that is just to put the gasket on push on it and then just tighten the screws by hand um, and um, tighten the screws by hand and then uh, coming with a torque wrench and uh, tightening them first just one go uh, just a little bit and then tightening them in two or three goes because the, the copper gasket will always give a little bit way until they're at the appropriate um, at the appropriate torque um, so the appropriate torque would be for CF40 would be, uh, I think, six Newton meters. Anyway, you can look that up on the um, uh, on the manufacturer's webpage, and I think 17 Newton meters for any of the larger uh, any of the larger flanges. Yeah, but you can you can look those up, and then you just tighten them uh, tighten them accordingly. So in terms of flange types, what do we have? I think uh, we have uh, so we have. The option to have rotatable and non-rotatable flanges. So if you know beforehand uh, what orientation you want to have, it's always good to have rotatable and uh, non-rotatable flanges because if you have a rotatable flange, you know the the flange uh, slides back, uh, slides to the back, and it exposes the knife edge. So it's pretty, it becomes pretty easy to damage the knife edge. So if I can. I always design non-rotatable flanges, but sometimes, you know, you just need a rotatable flange. Um, the flanges themselves, they can either have, uh, they can either have uh, a through hole or they can be tapped uh, so they can have a thread in there. Um, if you have a thread, it becomes pretty convenient to put a flange on. You just put the flange on and put the screw in. But the, the reason why we usually avoid tapped flanges is that... Um, if you bake your system to high temperature and one of the screws seizes, you essentially have to throw away your, your chamber. You have to throw away your chamber because you're not, not going to be able to open the screw and get rid of it. If that happens in a flange like this, then you can just come with a bolt cutter and cut open all the bolts around it. Yeah. Um, most of the flanges, um, most of the flanges come in different, um, in different tube diameters. So essentially for the same size flange, you could have a, a little bit of a larger tube and you would still be able to get the, uh, to get the head of the bolt here or a nut here. Um, but I, I would advise you that if you can make it, use a smaller tube. Um, and the reason for that is that if you use, ah, great, now it's seized up. Um, if you use a relatively large tube, then you will not be able to get a box wrench uh, over the bolt anymore, and it becomes pretty annoying to uh, pretty annoying to to um, to, um, to tighten up. Obviously, these are things where you sometimes need to make decisions on uh, you know how much convenience you want to have and how much space you have available and so on. Uh, but if you can, always leave uh, leave yourself some space for uh, uh, for mounting and demounting things. 
Good. Um, so this is these are the these are the CF flanges. So these are the flanges anywhere where we have ultra high vacuum. But we also have regular high vacuum flanges, and there we have two main types. Um, and the two main types are the uh, KF flanges, which is this part here has a K has KF flanges, and we have ISO flanges. And this here is an ISO flange, and you can already see the difference here is in size mostly. So um, ISO KF flanges are relatively simple. So you have some kind of uh, clamp going around the flange. Uh, uh, okay, that's been pretty tight, obviously. Yeah, bloody hell. This is under vac. This can't. This can't be under vacuum. No. Okay. Um. So they consist of, but yeah, that stuff sticks pretty good. Um, anyway, so ISO KF flanges are what you see, what you will see a lot with your pumps. Okay, so ISO KF flanges are essentially conical flanges. So you can see uh, here at the flange where uh, we have a little bit of a cone shape. Yeah, and um, let me just go in there maybe with the tweezers. Oh bloody hell! I think the, I think we push the uh, the aluminium rim into the uh, into the material more than we push the the seal in. Anyway, so here we have the typical seals. So you can see they have a rubber ga gasket on a some kind of uh, adjust uh, alignment ring, um, and all you need to do to close it up is put the two parts together. Obviously, here I've got a I've got a, a lid and a um, and a uh, and a cross. Yeah, just put it on. And um, you put on, you put in a clamp, and then it tightens the clamp, sort of, you know, as far as you can tighten it with your fingers, uh, and that's uh, that's doing your vacuum sealing. Then you don't need to over tighten it; it will just make it harder to open it again afterwards. Obviously, something we did. Um, and this is pretty much any, uh, everything there is to these flanges. These flanges are a lot cheaper than CF flanges, and they can get you down to about 10 to the minus 8 millibar, roughly 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 millibar with rubber gaskets. But if you want to go lower, you can buy metal gaskets. So this is, a, this is an aluminium gasket. This would, this would fit into here. Um, and if you use those aluminium gaskets, you can actually go into the 10 to the minus 9 millibar range uh, and I have some friends that are building uh, coating systems that claim they can go into the 10 to the minus 10 millibar range as well. Yeah? So you can go to relatively good vacuum ranges with those as well. Um, the KF flanges with the sort of the hand tightening, uh, they only have a limitation in terms of size. And so you will not be able to go any larger really than 40 millimeters uh, tube diameters. This is already what we have here. This is a KF40 flange. You can get 50 millimeter ones as well, but this is sort of the size limitation. Yeah? Uh, if you have a high vacuum flange and you need to go larger than that, what we use are so-called ISO K flanges and ISO F flanges. Uh, they're related. And what they are is essentially you have some kind of uh, seal like this here. Yeah? So this is actually part of, uh, part of the cryo interface of uh, one of our atom probes. And you can see you, can, you have some kind of uh, ring that holds everything stable and that puts it into, um, into a groove here in the, uh, in the actual vacuum part. Yeah. And then you have some kind of lip at the back of it that you can use to tighten the whole system. So if, you, know, you, put your, um, you put your gasket in, it snaps right into place. And then you have these screw clamps um, then you have these screw clamps that you can put here at the corner with the with the counter piece as well, and then you tighten everything up. And you can see all of those parts, you know, are made in large numbers, um, so these flanges are relatively affordable. Uh, there's another version of them called ISO F flanges, which use the same the same seals, uh, but instead of clamps, you're bolt you're bolting them down. Uh, these flanges are relatively similar in terms of vacuum performance to the uh, ISO-KF flanges. 
So expect to be able to go down to 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 7 millibars roughly. Um, so if you want to build a scanning electron microscope or a TEM or something like that, uh, that's good vacuum. Obviously, uh, for us in atom prop tomography, usually we need a little bit better vacuum than that. Good, but um, this is actually uh, what I need to say about uh, flanges. Uh, the only things that are left to say is um, for the uh, for the initial vacuum bits is um, something about the um, something about if we jump back to here. No, it becomes a little bit too many slides here already. Um, is essentially um, how we get virtual leaks and uh, if you design something and how to get rid of it. And I can see again, I wrote over the FAU logo. Sorry about that. Um, so the only thing that remains uh, is uh, actually what do we do about uh, gaps, venting holes, and vented screws, uh, which is essentially virtual, we call virtual leaks. And so virtual leaks uh, are actually something that can happen on the macro scale. So for example, say you have a screw hole, a tapped screw hole, right? And you put a screw in here and you fasten your screw. Yeah. What would happen is that you have, if you fasten it in air, you will have some you will have some air in here, and that air will slowly come out. Yeah. And the other type of virtual leaks you can have is leaks at the micro scale. So essentially, if you have rough surfaces, uh, if you have rough surfaces, then in between the surfaces, you can have pockets of air. And those pockets of air can uh, can then be released into your ultra high vacuum system. Uh, and so, um, obviously, what we need to do is um, is first of all um, we need to have, have venting holes. So venting holes just means that um, if you have something like this here, it would be good, you know, maybe you have a um, maybe you have a part that's only this thick. Oh, let me just draw it here. So a venting hole would be, for example, if we have a um, let's say we have a screw hole that goes into here. Uh, be a little bit long. So let's say we have a screw hole that goes in here sideways and our part ends here. Then we would drill another hole into here, right? So that any air any air can escape even if we have a even if we have a screw in here right um, and um, this is one way of doing it the other way of doing is it is having a vented screw and having a vented screw is just what it sounds like it's essentially having a screw
with either a hole in the middle or a screw and now I hope I am good enough to draw a bolt like this or a screw that has a slot or slit on the side, slot slit on the side um, and so that the air can escape through that. And the last thing we need to do is minimize contact between surfaces minimize contact and use UHV lubricant if there is if there is any movement any relative movement um, any relative movement in UHV uh, as well uh, so that you know um, oh that's not really that's not really that relevant to uh, to what we have here uh, but essentially minimize contact uh, minimize contact in air yeah, minimize contact of surfaces in air so that you won't have, don't have any micro uh, air bubbles trapped um, and uh, with that we can minimize the amount of virtual leaks that we have in our vacuum system okay um, with that actually um, the only thing that I forgot about to put in the syllabus that I actually still uh, want to talk about just for a minute or two is um, just because it hit us a couple of times is avoid parts seizing up at air during bake yeah, so we can have parts seizing up at air during bake or at at vacuum during operation uh, so at air during bake uh, we can have oxide formation And the oxide formation, because when the oxide grows, it takes up a, a larger volume. Uh, it would, for example, push you know a thread to uh, to seize. Uh, what we can do here is uh, use screws uh, that are plated. Um, use silver plated screws. And at vacuum during operation. We can have uh, we can have a loss of oxide, uh, usually because of friction. And if we have a loss of oxide, um, then uh, we can get cold welding between the parts. And I remember when I started doing atom probe, it was on an Oxford Nanoscience atom probe where you needed to screw the sample holders into some kind of small barrel and they used to seize up all the time. Uh, and here it's a loss of oxide. Uh, and so um, we need to use, we need to either limit the amount of force That's why threads are not usually a good idea in ultra high vacuum. So screwing something in an ultra high vacuum is always a bit of a problem because if you tighten things up, you apply a lot of pressure. Uh, or use UHV solid lubricants. So they're always solid lubricants. 
and this can be graphite. The problem with graphite is, uh, of course, in this case, you know, it, you might get a lot of graphite flakes running around in the system and graphite is conductive. And so if you have signals, high voltages and the like, you know, having graphite flakes in your system, not as good. Um, the other thing we can use is MOS2. Molybdenum disulfide um, and molybdenum disulfide can be coated on the parts. So you can, for example, get special ultra high vacuum bearings that have been coated with uh, molybdenum disulfide. The problem is molybdenum disulfide is not as good a lubricant at ambient pressures, so it's only really good at ultra high vacuum pressures. Um, and that's why some, maybe you have friends that can do molybdenum disulfide coating. We have people here at Mechanical Engineering that work on spacecraft systems. They, they can do stuff like that. Um, and some uh, ultra vacuum bearings and the like you, and bushings you can buy with uh, molybdenum disulfide coatings. But if you can uh, if you can do it, just limit the amount of force that uh, that that parts are ex uh, that parts experience when they are limited. So if you have something where you need force in an ultra high vacuum system, it's probably going to seize up at some point, unless you can uh, lubricate it very well. Okay. And with that, we're uh, at the end of the first part of the lecture. I think with an hour and 46, it was already long enough. Uh, and the next part of the lecture is going to be on, um, uh, is going to be on pumping of ultra high vacuum systems. So what kind of pumps do we have and what is their performance?